I'm, I'm dressed for the occasion tonight. I can see I'm matching the furniture, so it's always a good start. <laughs> ah, right, so yes, I'm from the Natural History Museum, and I'm hoping, yes, it's come up. It's risen from the dead. So my title is, How Does Curating the Dead Influence the Study of the Living? Ah, right. So most of you might have been to this big, grand place. It's the Natural History Museum. But many of you might not be aware that I actually work in this place. It's at the back of the museum, in the newest part called the Darwin Centre. So I actually work in there. And I wear two big hats. So I'm a principal curator and I'm a museum scientist. So most of you know what scientists do in general. So I have a background in marine biology. But do you know what a curator does behind the scenes at the museum there? And how me curating the dead actually influences the living? So I curate this stuff, this dead stuff. So it's marine invertebrates. It's animals without backbones. And it's things like, so we've got an isopod, we've got an amphipod. We've got wood lice too. They're not insects, by the way. They're crustaceans. So everything I'm going to show you here are all crustaceans. We've got crabs. We've got Chinese mitten crabs, invasive species in the Thames. We've got more crabs. <laughs> we've got a spider crab. And we've got a blue swimming crab. So all of these things I actually curate. So they're dead and they're pickled in jars. So this, pitch, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't wear a pretty dress like this every day, but I'm like, it's nice to show it off. Um, so there's me handling some, um, some lobsters and um, a box crab there. So that's me in my um, you know, natural setting. So a lot of the things that I look after are dead, as I say, but they're pickled in jars in um, a preservation fluid, um, either 80% pure ethanol, 80% industrial methylated spirits. So essentially, it's a liquid that keeps that material like that available to scientists for hundreds of years so that they can study them. So this is me doing my, my um, glamour shots here, you know, the, the first modelling, as you do, um, a modelling behind the scenes at the museum for trolleys. <laughs> but very important to care for those specimens uh, so that people can do their scientific studies. Ah, but there is a, another classic example of me in the lab. So the curatorial process preservation allows me to look at the material and other scientists underneath a microscope. I also document the material and write, um, well, we don't so much handwrite labels too much nowadays. They're all printed from a special printer. But that handwriting is of value too because we have this at the museum, a data portal. So when I curate the specimens, it's really important that I curate and document as accurately as possible, because if I don't, then any other scientist accessing our data portal that has all the information, the locality, the depth that they found in the world's oceans and things like that, that could impact on their science. But the beauty of our data portal is that we have time series of of the data of materials. So a lot of you may ask, well, why do we have all this stuff? This is why we have this stuff. This is what makes the museum really unique. And you all can access this data so that you can look at the time series and compare it to what's going on in the world's oceans today. Another reason why I curate things like this. So this is a Chinese mitten crab. It's in the River Thames at the moment, and it's considered an invasive species. Now. Way back when, we had a mitten crab hotline, would you believe? So I was manning the phones at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we had to stop that because actually what we wanted to get data on was how far and how wide these species were up and down the River Thames and other rivers and estuaries that, that stem off that. But we had to tell the fishermen and anglers that no more mitten crabs. I don't need any more for my collection. That's it. But they can actually reach dinner plate size, and they're actually quite an aggressive species. So the data that we've got can now be used to monitor the populations. We're still monitoring them in the Thames. Um, they are eaten in some countries. I wouldn't advise it here. But um, they are quite an aggressive to our native species. And also, to, re to actually breed, they will um, burrow into the bank side of the Thames. And that can cause um, structural damage and collapse. So 
Another reason why it's great that I curate and document specimens properly. So, can you see that on one side there's an electric blue lobster, and on the other side there's probably a lobster that we're more used to seeing, a darker kind of blue, mottled brown kind of colour. Well, Bluey, as I called him, he was found in 2011 on a fish market. And we got a phone call at the museum um, saying that this guy bought it and he wanted to know the reasons why um, this uh, lobster might be the elect that electric blue. So again, we had our own collection beautifully curated. Um, so this is a European mo uh, lobster called Homarus gammarus. And so we were able to compare to um, the natural colouring of the species, to this, which then shows you how blue that is. And the reason why it's that electric blue is because there has been some kind of um, genetic variation, a mutation in the bindings of the protein that would actually have given it its natural colour, a darker blue, but it's gone quite bright. So this is Bluey because he stayed quite still. I'm saying he, I didn't actually sex it. <laughs> um, stayed quite still for the photograph, but in the laboratory in our tank, we had to um, sort of um, uh, hold his hands together, so to speak. So I'm lucky enough as well to curate some really special collections at the museum. And what you can see here on the screen is a drawer of Charles Darwin's barnacles. It's not every day you can say, I look after Darwin's barnacles. That could get you into trouble, of course, as well. I have to be careful what I say. Um, <laughs> But, you know, as well as everything, you know, evolution of man, Darwin's finches and things, he spent eight years obsessively, um, you know, researching these barnacles. That's all he did. So much so that he persuaded the trustees of the British Museum at the time, because we weren't at our current home um, in South Kensington way back when in the 1840s. Um, he persuaded them to allow him to have the whole barnacle collection from the museum sent to him at Down House so that he could, in the luxury of his own home, examine these things. So there's, I'm just proving that, gla uh, that glamour can be in the barnacle world as well, <laughs> not just those encrusting things on the seashore. So those colourful ones are um, a, a version of stalked barnacles there, and there's a great man himself. And the, re the reason why it's important to curate these accurately too, there's, again, a lot of information with those specimens. Barnacles themselves are, uh, can be invasive species. They're fouling organisms that encrust themselves onto the bottom of ships, which um, cause a problem because then those ships that are um, commercially transporting our goods across the world, they have to use more fuel because they've got a drag on their, on their ships because of these organisms there. So we use the collection to monitor um, species um, worldwide in the oceans and compare to what's happening today. And just one little thing that Darwin actually found out that barnacles were an upside down shrimp as well, a shrimp on its head too. So there, there is some benefits to studying those things for eight years. <laughs> Um, so, again, as I showed you the NHM data portal, we've got another wonderful portal um, that you all can have a look at, and it's a HMS Challenger collections um, database. And Challenger, um, the, the ship Challenger, actually launched and went um, observing the world's oceans from about 1872 for a couple of years. And it's considered, on that expedition, it was the birth of oceanographic science. And it's where scientists actually, for the first time, were... Um, going with specific scientific questions, how deep is the world's oceans? So we've got a lot of collections from that expedition, and um, at the time, in the 1870s, about 4,500 new species to science were actually named. But we still have a lot more to examine, so there's still material behind the scenes from that point in time. But again, what's the beauty of this, that we have original new species there, and that is used for comparison to modern-day um, specimens that are sampled. So that's just some maps showing you worldwide. And again, this is me doing another glamour shot here, um, <laughs> um, advertising the Darwin Centre. But what I'm holding in that jar is um, a coconut crab. And I've got a little bit of info on the other slide there with it. So coconut crabs, um, they are a protected species. They're the largest land crab in the world, so they can essentially live um, entirely on land. But what I'm grateful for in this sense of curating a collection is that we don't 
don't have many jars of that because there are only probably about 20 jars in the collection. It's really important to think about conservation messages too. And so you're not allowed to um, actually kill a crab of a certain size or a female carrying eggs. So again, using the data that we've got for species protection. And then that's me. I just want to um, wish everybody a happy Ada Lovelace Day. So there's me with Maggie. Most people might know her from TV and Sky at Night. And then um, the lady at the top shot in black and white is um, Isabella Gordon, a Scottish scientist who came to London. She was the first female at the Natural History Museum to, have, to get paid and have a full-time job at the museum. And I actually use the same tools that she used in the um, 1930s at the museum. So I've kind of followed in her footsteps. And lastly, I want to thank you all for listening. And there's a picture of me when I was young, and I used to watch the TV and see all the Christmas lectures here, so I thought it was appropriate to put a small picture of myself. Thank you. Thank you.